who, who maybe I don't know. My name is Brett Krauss. I'm the assistant principal. I realized that everyone, everyone's time is valuable. And everyone has places that they need to be. However, the point of tonight is to make sure that everyone is informed of the importance of making appropriate decisions and the safety and considerations that need to go into a special event like the prom. And I know that you're all excited and I look forward to celebrating with all of you, but just briefly, in very quickly looking up statistics about prom, one third, 33% of all alcohol related teen traffic fatalities, not accidents, fatalities occur during prom season. So it's so important that the presentation that we have here tonight, not only do you pay attention to, but you respect the information that's being shared and understand that it's for everyone's safety and for everyone's benefit. We're fortunate we have some special presenters with us tonight from Northwell who are going to highlight some different aspects of things that you need to consider with regards to making appropriate decisions and all of the different components of prom that may affect your safety. So I know that you want to get out of here. If everyone follows suit, we'll be done close to seven. Okay, we have a few different a few different components to the presentation that will start in here. And then for the last piece of the presentation, students and parents will be separated so that you can hear specific information relevant to you. And then the program will end. I want to highlight that outside in the hallway, our Prevention Task Force Committee has a table set up Ms. Mendick can set it up. There's information available for parents in case you want any of that paperwork that's there for you. Ms. Kincaid, Ms. Longo, Mr. Gherkin, they're in the auditorium lobby making sure that everyone's paperwork is in order with regards to the prom. And just a couple of important announcements before I pass things off. Eligibility. Eligibility, the eligibility policy, this is a board policy, understand that any extracurricular activity comes under this uh, guise of the eligibility policy, including prom. So if you're failing two or more classes from the latest eligibility report, which was sent out at progress courts for the fourth quarter, you need to complete an eligibility progress report, and if you show no progress, you need to complete an appeal form. Both of those are due this Friday. There will be a quick turnaround, so you'll know very quickly whether or not you are approved, but that is this Friday for any student that is on the eligibility, eligibility list with regards to failing multiple classes. Some basic procedural things that were shared pre-prom, begins on the waterfront at 4 p.m. You'll get more details about pre-prom shortly, but it begins at 4 p.m. The inn at New High Park, where we're having prom, don't get there before 7 p.m. Won't be allowed in before 7 p.m. Check-in is required on arrival. Your cars, anything that you arrive in, it can be inspected, not just by us, but also the venue, if they so choose. Um, and any students suspected being under the influence may be subject to a breathalyzer test, and if you refuse, then 
uh, you sacrifice admission into the event. During the prom, very straightforward, any student under the influence or possession of any illegal substances will be removed. You'll have to come pick them up, parents, guardians, and it also could impact the privilege of participating in the graduation ceremony. Once you leave the venue, once you leave the inn, you may not return. And the outdoor patio where the event where we're being hosted is only available during cocktail hours. So once cocktail hour is over and you have to go inside, you have to remain inside until you decide to leave. After the prom, prom ends at 11 p.m. Make sure you have a ride to pick you up on time at 11 p.m. The next day, the senior walkthrough. So seniors, please be here at 8 a.m. Walkthrough begins at 9 a.m. If you have specific questions about that, of course, you can ask in school, you can speak to prom advisors, your grade advisors, and they can help you with everything. I want to pass things over to our representatives from Northwell, who are going to go through the various pieces with you tonight. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kayla Zunian. I work for Senior Relations at Northwell Health. Tonight, we're going to go over how to keep students safe at prom and prom related activities. We're going to do three 20 minute sessions, and then we'll break down in that last session. Students will come with Brett and I to the chorus room, and parents will stay here with Debbie. Um, if you have any questions, please don't be afraid to ask, and ask them at the end of each presentation. Without further delay, here's Jilly and Sabina. Thank you. So, my name is Jillian. I work at Cohen Children's Medical Center. I'm the intervention coordinator there. My job is to come out into the community, into schools, um, community organizations, churches, and talk to people about how they can make, keep themselves safe. So today, I'm going to speak to you about distracted and reckless driving. Um, even passengers can be distracted and reckless. So we're going to get into that in a minute. But first, I just wanted to put this image up. Because basically, we're all here to talk to you about decisions. We're going to give you information. And as teenagers, some of you may be going off to college in two months. Um, those of you that are juniors may already be driving. All the seniors, I'm sure, are driving. Basically, you're adults at this point. You're still living under your parents' roof, but you're making your own choices. So these are the five steps to decision making. And step five is reflection on your decision. Now, that can go either one of two ways, depending on the choice you made. If you made a good choice or a bad choice. Any guesses as to why everyone has been impressing on you for the last couple of years about making good decisions? Are people, are your teachers and family members targeting you because you guys are bad people? No. Teenagers, what do you think? Why are we spending so much time talking to you about your decisions? Because we don't want it to do the wrong thing and go down the wrong path. Right, we don't want you to make a poor choice and have a bad outcome, a life changing outcome. The other thing is we know that you're not equipped to make good decisions. And that's because of the anatomy of your body. Your brain is not fully developed until you're the age of 25. So it's really easy for you to make bad choices at this point because your brain is still developing. You don't have the capacity to make good ones. You're thinking with your emotions, with your wants, not the part of your brain that can not the part of your brain that can look at the different outcomes. That's how adults think. So as you go through each presentation tonight, I want you to think of these five steps and how different decisions can change the outcome of your life. So I'm going to start my presentation off with a question. What do you consider lethal? Someone tell me, what's lethal to you? What can be deadly? Okay, so that's so let's focus on the 
the mechanism of death, right? You can tell me what's something that's deadly to you. What's something that's deadly? What comes to mind? Heroin. Heroin. Okay, thank you. Heroin is definitely lethal. That's something that can kill us. Now, if we had a syringe and it was full of heroin and it was on the seat, in that moment, is that heroin lethal to anyone in this room? No, what has to happen in order for it to become lethal? Right. So people need to a person needs to make the decision to use the heroin. So when we hear the word lethal, I do this, an extended version of this program in schools all over NASA, Suffolk, and Queens. A lot of times when I throw that question out, I'll hear things like heroin, especially with the current opioid epidemic that's going on. More on that later. Uh, guns, bombs. People will throw out what we hear about a lot on the news. But what I don't hear a lot of when I pose that question is cars. And motor vehicles is the leading cause of death for all Americans under the age of 40. And as you heard before, during prom season, it's even more common. And that's because teens are out a lot. You guys are doing a lot of great things from. Um, a lot of you may have your own cars at this point. Juniors and seniors, you're all new drivers up until you've been driving for five years. So that means you're not really as um, experienced as maybe your parents or other people in your life. So we don't think about cars as something that's lethal, but the reality is cars kill more people in your age group than any other cause of death, than gun violence, than drug use. Motor vehicle crashes kill around 4,000 teens in our country every single year. And these crashes, and I call them crashes, not accidents, because an accident is something we have no control over. These crashes are 100% preventable. This image that you see, I don't know, might be a little grainy. This is a skull. It's actually comprised of a bunch of different colored dots. Um, on here we have white, red, yellow, green, and pink. But the color that's overwhelmingly represented is white. So for the parents in the room, I want you to think about what that means for your teenager. Have conversations with them about making good decisions behind the wheel. Have actual consequences if they don't make good decisions behind the wheel. Because the choice that they make today may not only affect the rest of their life, but it can affect someone else's. So, I have an activity that we're going to do together. I hope you guys can see it together. Okay, so this is the probability wheel. Basically what this does, this lets us know this is designed for new drivers because new drivers lack experience. So this lets us know what our increased risk of getting into a crash is by different scenarios. Now, I like to do some benign scenarios to kind of let you guys see. So we're going to go right now. I'm driving in the car. I have no one in the car with me. It's a beautiful sunny day. My radio is off, and I'm not following a GPS. I know exactly where I'm going. I'm at no greater risk of getting into a car crash in this scenario. By adding one passenger, so having one friend in the car with you, driving on a sunny day without a GPS, knowing where you're going, and the radio off, you're 139% more likely to get into a car crash. If you add another passenger, now you're at 185% more likely to get into a car crash. That's because your peers, your friends, they're a distraction when you're behind the wheel. They're a cognitive distraction. They're taking your mind off of driving and putting it on something else because reality is you don't drive in the car in silence. Now, an interior distraction is something that's in the car. We all change the radio station. There's tons of commercials, so let's do operating a stereo. So two passengers in the car, changing the radio station, you're 485% more likely to get into a car crash in that scenario. Now, 
I'm not even going to add text messaging on because I know everybody in this room knows how dangerous that is. I'm sure you've heard it a million times. I'm going to do phone operation. Something like operating a GPS. We all have smart cars now. Our GPS is usually on the computer screen of our car if you have a new one. By operating the GPS on this screen in your car, you're 885% more likely to get into a crash. That's a pretty large number. Now, again, this is for a new driver, for an experienced driver. It would look a little different. But guess what? All the teams in this room are new drivers. Because none of you have been driving since you were 14. So again, this isn't to scare you, but this is to make you realize that there are things that go on that you may not necessarily look at as increasing your risk of getting into a crash. So when you are behind the wheel or you're a passenger in a car, it's really important that you make good choices so you don't become one of the dots in that image that we saw here. Because each one of those dots represents a life. Each one of those dots has a parent, has friends, has people that care about them, teachers. This is a really fun time and your life is just beginning. If you make a bad choice, that can all be taken away from you. So this is a story, it's quick, of uh, there's a lot of decisions made this day. We're going to hear it from the perspective of the driver's friends um, and family members. Families and then like, do you hear what's going to happen to send you to the truth? I share Facebook and all of a sudden there's all these like, I love you Sydney, our kids and I'm so I tried calling her, she didn't answer. I tried calling her mom, her mom didn't answer. And then finally I drove her to her house and she wasn't there. It was horrible. She was the most amazing person that I've ever met. You know, like that person that would put people in a bad mood? She was always trying to put people in a good mood. She was one of the best people I know. Her heart was so big, I had never met anybody with a heart as big as hers. We were working on building a tree house in our backyard, and uh, Sydney very much uh, wanted to be involved and help out. And, you know, I'm up on the ladder uh, trying to shingle the tree house, and I'm a little nervous being up there. And Sydney climbs up, and she's laying across the roof, uh, nailing shingles, and she didn't have any fear. She looked as good as she has to. Um, seeing her at her windows in the backyard on top of her roof, and then a piece of Sydney that was very unique to her, I think, versus other teenagers, is she still had a very big kid heart. She was on the ground, I was in the flag, and she had friends staying with me. We had talked about on the phone festival, and I told her that I wanted to go. She was like, yeah, I want to go too. She runs down steps, she's got her bag, and she's like, okay, I'm going to make you talk, love you, see you tomorrow. And I said, okay, not know me, that was going to be The last time she was so good. That night they were heading back from uh, Pumpkin uh, Farm, and they were heading down the highway, and um, Joe, the passenger, was looking at his cell phone and he felt the car jerk. It hit on the other side of the grassy median and flipped the car over. I was very close to hitting the car myself, so I kind of closed my eyes. I think it was on my brakes and I when I got out of the car and, and saw Joseph jump right out. Um, and I realized that he was searching for Sydney. So that was when I started helping him look for it. I felt like he landed it. At that point, so I didn't find out what we're actually what happened. I just knew that it was a vehicle that crossed the median hill railroad, so much had been ejected, which me immediately means um, uh, able to say is that the seagull was born in the case. I started calling Costco after a hospital until finally they answered and told me she was there. Right. Using medications for her blood pressure to keep her heart beating. Um, we were using the ventilator to keep her breathing. We finally made it to the emergency room, and when the highway patrol vehicle showed up, and she said she was ejected from the vehicle, she wasn't wearing her seatbelt. I thought, why? Why did she have a And in the 
ER doctor comes in and he's like, she's very, very sick. She hit her head. We're going to try to take a swelling in, but where she was hit, it's, it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to do anything for her. And her mom answered the phone at the hospital and told me to come up because she looked like a blanket and couldn't say goodbye. We knew the whole time that we were in the hospital that we were going to have to have a conversation with our kids and let them know that she's not coming home. And it was it was almost like you hearing it again because you're experiencing their brand new grief. You started crying. Was it crazy and saying, Mom, how We keep her in our conversations on a daily basis. She's still a very integral part of our lives, even though she's not here. Miss having fun with her and I'm being friends with her and saying, I will soon say stuff like that. Um, there was still a, a lot of unanswered questions of why. A bunch of cops like, came over and started like, asking me a bunch of questions like, what are we doing, what happened, why did we swerve off the road? And I was just like, I saw her when we were going off the road, she like, threw her phone. Start putting everything together and realizing that this is a texting and driving crash. Um, we were able to specifically say it was texting and not anything else. Learning from us for Sydney, you know, because it affected us as healthcare workers, it affected us as people, it affected us. Um, as mothers and aunts and cousins and sisters, this is something that isn't just going to affect you. This is something that over my the baby gets so need to be so distracted. There's nothing that's important enough that's going to cause you to lose your life. There's not a single thing important enough for some reason. She made a bad decision that day. She clearly was touching her phone, and whether it was texting or looking at something on her phone, um, that caused the accident. And she also made a bad decision not to wear a seatbelt. That caused her death. Joe was the front passenger in the car. He was wearing his seatbelt. Um, he walked away from the collision. Vicky was a passenger in the rear seat. Uh, she had the lap belt on, but she had the shoulder belt behind her back. I broke my arm, I broke my neck, and I broke my back. For the longest time, I was playing for a full thing, so I could stop if I was not on my phone and text my mom. I don't remember the accident, I don't remember what had happened. I was sorry that when we get to tell her bye, or that I loved her, that she wasn't going to graduate with this. I was sorry that it even like happened. on the decisions that they made. Again, we're bringing it back to decisions. So we had Joe. Joe was the front seat passenger. He had on his seatbelt. He walked away from the car crash physically uninjured. He certainly talked about some of the emotional scars that he had, but physically he's okay. Then we have uh, Sydney. Sydney was the driver. She made two really bad decisions that day and didn't think about what the outcomes were. One, she decided to text and drive. So she wasn't really paying attention. She was distracted, very reckless. And two, she decided she wasn't going to wear your seatbelt. So 
So as a result, she was thrown from the vehicle. If you ever hear someone was thrown from the vehicle, it means one of two things. They didn't have a seatbelt on, or they were a child that was, that was too small for the seatbelt, so it wasn't able to keep them in the car. Then we have the backseat passenger, Vicky. So Vicky had her seatbelt on, she stayed in the car, but she had it on incorrectly. Taking that shoulder belt and putting it behind you when you're traveling in the car is one of the most dangerous things you can do as a driver or even as a passenger. Because the seatbelt has two jobs. The first, we said, keeps us in the car, in our seat. The second, it keeps the top half of our body restrained against the vehicle seat. Without that shoulder strap, if you take it and put it behind you, the top half of your body is free to fall in any direction, and your head can make contact with hard surfaces, windows, or other people in the vehicle. And you can sustain life-altering injuries. In the extended version of this video, Vicki, the backseat passenger, talked about how she had aspired to be a nurse. She was just like all of you when this happened. She was a junior in high school. Um, unfortunately, due to the severity of her injuries, she can't be a nurse because physically she has limitations now. So it's not always death that's an outcome from poor choices. Sometimes it's life-altering injuries that can affect your ability to talk, your ability to walk, your ability to make and function on your own to control your impulses. All of these things really can happen. Um, we talked about what the seatbelt does, and for those of you that are skeptical about wearing a seatbelt, you can ask your parents when you leave tonight. I guarantee you, growing up, your parents lost more than one person in their life in a motor vehicle crash. And that's because seatbelt laws are still fairly new. Cars are getting safer, they have airbags now. Seatbelt systems are getting better, smarter, but we still have a lot of work to do because it's still the leading cause of death for all Americans under the age of 40, and it is 100% preventable. If there was a disease that was preventable and was the number one cause of death in our country, people would be rioting that they want a vaccine or a cure for it. Car crashes are no different. So what can you do? Take in all the information that you're getting tonight, not just from me, from everyone, to make good choices. Remember that car crashes are 100% preventable. And the biggest piece that I hope you take away from tonight is that you should be wearing your seatbelt regardless, regardless of the seating position that you're in. Any questions? No? All right, I'm going to pass it over. Hi everybody, my name is Dan Adams. I am the Children Director from the Star Operations Center. Not a shop, we're Star Operations, you say. Um, we are one of five substance abuse treatment centers that are operated by North Bell Health. And so tonight, I'm going to talk with you guys a little bit about drugs and alcohol. Um, again, making good, non lethal decisions, and of course, the problem. So our objective tonight, basically in short order, we're going to explore substance use in the prom. Very important topic. I know you guys are looking forward to the prom. Um, you know, I was young once too, as were your parents. There is a lot of expectation for prom. People look at this as very first kind of coming of age activity as being an adult. So we all understand that we were a student or a parent or an educator here or my colleagues. Um, you know, what, what's going to happen? There's going to be a lot of celebration. And everybody, there's probably going to be some alcohol. There's going to be some drugs. There might even be some sex. And for some of you, no matter what happens to you tonight, there's going to be some degree of regret. But what we're going to try to do is really, again, help you to make some good decisions so that any regrets you might have are not life altering in some really, really bad ways. So we'll work together a little bit to talk about some of the potential risks that you might be exposed to on any day. And also to help you think ahead a little bit and maybe devise some type of strategies to manage any sort of a high risk situation that you might actually find yourself in. And it's always really helpful to be prepared. Um, 
Because when you get stuck and you get thrown into something and you haven't given it a lot of thought, um, there's a lot of potential there to really not do the right thing simply because you haven't had the thought about it and you're not sure about what to do. So tonight I'm just going to ask you to listen. I'm going to ask you to be open a little bit and put these things in the back of your head. It may just come in handy for you. So I don't have a long time to speak with you, so I'm going to address like three really key points. The first thing is substance abuse. I'm talking here more about opioids. I'm talking here more about prescription drugs. Um, one of your high school seniors say that prescription opioids are readily available to them. Does anybody know how that is? Why is it so easy to get prescription opioids? What do we find about like that? Can't hear you. Your cabinets, your medicine jobs. Mom, dad, go to the dentist have a torn meniscus, have some knee surgery, um, have some other type of surgery, and people end up stockpiling this. They don't think about it. Maybe you've gone to the doctor, you've had some type of anxiety or something else that you were treated for. Okay, I feel better now and kind of leave that prescription. Um, a lot of substance abuse starts with people just experimenting. First and foremost, I'm here to tell you, just because the doctor prescribes a medication it doesn't mean it's any safer than anything somebody from this group would give you. So that's really important. People look and say, oh, that's our family physician. This is my mom's doctor. I can have a little fun with this. It's not too risky. Um, I can't tell you how wrong you might be for so many reasons. First and foremost, everybody is unique in their own way. Um, their biology, their physiology, their brain chemistry is very different. You might have a friend that tries some Xanax or tries some Percocets or tries some Oxys or Roxys and you're like, wow, that was great. You need to do this. And so you may go ahead and say, well, if she likes it, if he likes it, I might like it. And you can have a totally different and very, very bad experience. So that's first and foremost. Parents are really going to prevail on you to take stock of your medicine cabinet and not leave things around that are easily accessible. I'm going to do this and not put your fingers at anybody or anything else, but so much when people get into drugs and alcohol starts with something that's innocuous as your medicine cabinet at home. So you need to be mindful about that. The second statistic on the screen, one of five drugs have, one of five teens have a huge prescription drugs. That's, that's a lot, that's 20%. So if we have 100 kids in here, 20 people here have already gotten started with that. And it's more than likely they got it from a strip that was sitting in your medicine chest or a friend, a friend, so on and so forth. Lastly, 2,500 teens have used prescription drugs for the first time every day. So that's a lot. You know, you might ask yourself, well, why do people do this? They do it for a lot of reasons. Um, first and foremost, people are curious. The last presenter talked a lot about your brain and how it's evolving and how it's changing. You're doing a lot of new things right now. So some of you are very into having now experiences. You'd like to alter your perception of reality. You want things to be more exciting. Maybe you're trying to cope with some stressors you're having some difficulty with. So, you know, we have the internet too, which is just chocolate with information. Sometimes too much of a good thing too. So people learn that they can abuse prescription drugs, they can take opioids, they can take Xanax, they can lessen their anxiety, take the edge off. Maybe they feel a little more social that way. So things are easier for them. Um, then, of course, we have the other end of the spectrum. We have folks that put a lot of pressure on themselves. They may be athletic. They want to excel in the studies. They have after-school jobs. They want to keep things going. They want to focus. So they learn, like, wow, I can take a little bit of battle off. This is really helpful for me as well. Um, again, those things are not such good things to do. And it's unfortunate, too, because there's like so many different ways especially out here on the island, that you can recreate, you can get relief, you can talk to people, there's hobbies, there's different interests. Um, you might not understand and recognize it today, but every time you choose drugs or alcohol over speaking with somebody or learning with how you feel yourself, you really start to kind of diminish your choices and your possibilities. I speak to you as a professional, but I also speak to you as a person, I speak to you as a parent, as kids just a few years older, um, I didn't grow up terribly far from here, and I just want to say one thing to you. In some ways, I'm uniquely qualified to stand here tonight 
I saw that was supposed to have lost 11 friends. That's a lot of people to bury. Um, a lot of that was a result of car accidents. It's a number of that was also people that overdosed. A couple of drowning episodes as well. So they took off from the water. And all of that was really preventable. And I mean, this first hand, I felt like my life was really torn apart and really open. Like, we talked a lot about like stars that you see with people and how people's lives have changed. Somebody's going to be in therapy forever, but they can't be nursed. Sometimes the stars are the hardest to go with are the ones that you can't see. And it's all trauma, and it's all loss that are associated with the case like this. So please, I'm asking you guys, think very hard about your choices on how many. Um, if you decide to talk a little bit about what happens when you start to mix drugs and mix alcohol. Um, the next thing is the underage drinking stats. We talked about this a little bit. Nearly one third of all drug driving accidents happen to people between the ages of 16 and 20. And again, if you're repeating, most of that happens in the season. So that's a lot. The trauma is really scary. It's scary for you folks, it's scary for all the rest of us. Um, you know, alone, there's over 10 million underage drinkers in the United States. And of that group, one in six binge drinks. Does anybody here know? How many drinks you have to have in one sitting? Do you consider it a binge drinker? Nobody's too sure about that. Six drinks in one sitting will qualify you for binge drinking. And binge drinking is uniquely dangerous, even if you don't do it often, because when you raise your blood alcohol level very fast and you spike it, a lot of things happen to your brain in a short order. Um, I was mixed up on this last statistic here. Only one one hundred pounds for these kids that are teens in space. Which also lets me know maybe that parents and kids don't often talk about these things and <laughs> show. And those are hard conversations for a whole load of reasons. They're hard to have as a parent. They're also hard to have as a teenager. But it's really, really important to talk. Um, kids and parents aren't supposed to be your friends, but they are here to help you grow into the adults. And parents, you know, with the best intention of our kids' strength. And when we talk to them and we know that, you know, we're going to be there for them, we're going to listen, sometimes it's just really helpful. Um, how many 90% of teens believe that their peers are more likely to drink and drive on prom night? I'm almost afraid to ask, but who's taking part in prom? I show of hands. Who's taking a part to prom? So a few folks, most of you are doing limos, Uber, maybe a ride. Who's going to go home for prom and take the car out to go someplace else? Who's going to come from the New York Park Inn and go home and say, hey, let's drive to Manhattan. Let's drive down the beach. Let's go to that bar down the road and serve underage people. Oh no, some of you are starting to do that. And it's the way that's even more concerning and more dangerous than coming back and forth to the prom. Um, I listen to your administrator. I can't tell you how awesome it is that you have so much supervision and that people are so concerned with well being. But I know you, we all know you. Kids are who we are. You get to do what you can to kind of be passive and then go to what you like to do. So we're going to help you try to make some choices to help you to stay safe. Um, another statistic on this, 54% of students have four or more drinks on prom night. What, what do you think happens to you when you start to drink? Six drinks, four drinks? Where are we going with that? What starts to happen in your brain? Anybody want to think about that? Anybody know? Nobody. Then what's the point? Why do we drink? I can't hear you. To have fun? Ah, to have fun, to feel adult, to feel a little less awkward, to mark the passages to adult good. There's a million reasons why people are different. And we get that, we understand that. We might not like the choice, we're going to make a bad choice, at least make a safe choice. Don't become the statistic. Don't become one of 5,000 people that are going to die with you, but from underage drinking, get a car accident. So how do we stay safe? What do we do? We make a plan. Um, one thing we can think about 
as clients that might sell, you might want to use a value system. Think ahead of time. You're going out, you're going to this problem, you're going to visit your friends afterwards. Somebody who's maybe not with you should know a little, about, a little bit about where you're going. So you can call, identify somebody that you know, you can text them, maybe just an X, but they need to come and get you. Or you can call them up and say, here's where I am. Things didn't end up so well. I need a ride. If that's not comfortable for you, everybody in here shows a smartphone. Get an Uber app, get a Lyft app. There's no reason to be out the car. There's no reason to be in a situation where you feel unsafe or pressure, whether it's to drink, whether it's to have sex, whether it's to do drugs. All right, you always can have another plan. Think a little bit about what to say. Sometimes, you know, people are very bold and say, hey, no thanks, I got this. I'm not interested. That's not how I roll. Sometimes people don't necessarily feel that empowered to say that sort of thing. That's okay too. Say I'm a designated driver. I don't want to ruin my season. I don't want to get in trouble with the coach. I had enough struggles graduating this year. I don't want to be in trouble tomorrow morning. I want to walk at my graduation. Whatever it is you need to say. Even if you need to text an ex to somebody so that they know to call you and say, hey, you need to come home. Grandma's really sick. It doesn't make a difference. The whole point is, think about what you would do if you're faced with a situation that you're uncomfortable with and you recognize it has some risk in it for you. Whether it's driving, whether it's drugging, whether it's intimate contact with somebody, whatever the case may be, make a plan ahead. Be open to that, just think about it. You have, what, like 10 days to get from? Nine days? Let that just sit a little bit. Let it sit. So another concern that we would have to also is the whole idea of not only doing drugs in common, but also mixing a variety of drugs. Why might you do that? Some of you might go out and inevitably and say, well, I want to party today. This is great. You have to get up in the morning. And so you may already be wise to the fact that if you drink, you take some amphetamines, you do some coke, maybe you feel like the drink is not going to impact so much. You can keep up with the crowd, you can keep stuff going. So people at the time think, oh, this is a really, really good idea. Not so much at all, because you have no idea what you're ingesting or how much of it. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's a stimulant, and both of these things synergistically, which means together or separate, it has some very negative effects on your body. Um, the other things that people sometimes mix are depressants and alcohol. So maybe somebody's drinking, they do some opiates, and they take some benzos, somebody's got some Xanax, they have some Valium. So, all right, this is great. Let me pop some of these. I'll spend a little less on alcohol. Or better yet, they're checking, 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 and nobody can smell this. So you really think that you're slick, but not so much, because both of these types of drugs act like central nervous system depressants. So what happens is they start to slow your heart rate, your breathing, your respiration, and that can also lead to a very fatal overdose. Um, lastly, some people may opt to use what we call hallucinogenics. So X, Lomalis, LSD, marijuana, those are all drugs that alter your perception. So you may think that you're okay, you may think that you're doing something very safe, whether it's climbing up on a tower, a fence, going out on the jetties on the ocean, operating a motor vehicle, but the truth is, you really can't tell. You don't know, because your perceptions and your viewpoint perspective of reality have completely been altered. So why am I telling you this? Because in each of these scenarios, this is going to open you up to some really high risk and potentially lethal or dangerous behaviors. First and foremost, um, when you mix bad drugs and alcohol, um, the effects of them definitely do be exaggerated in some different ways. Um, slowing and stopping respiration. I'm sure that not only do the parents here have people that they watch, that there's a couple of people here too that know folks that overdose and buy on drugs. Maybe it's prescription drugs, maybe it was a mixture of alcohol and some type of pills. Sometimes people do things and it's, you know, it's an unintentional overdose. They just do a little too much or they get upset, they get angry, they leave the crowd, later for the oh, I'm so angry, let me finish the six pack, let me grab some of this stuff. 
What do you think happens? People get very tired. Their respiration slows, their heartbeat slows, their brain gets kind of groggy. They fall asleep. And then sometimes too, people become ill, they vomit in their sleep, and they aspirate and they choke for their own vomit. Um, that happens very frequently on an accidental overdose. It's a really awful way to tragically go. And I'm going to tell you something, don't make your child, your friend, or your sibling, or your cousin die from a drug overdose. Kids know less devastating than the film that we all watched with the poor young lady that was texting and driving, also the result of really not making decisions. Um, other things that can happen through alcohol and ecstasy or other blood drugs, that's dangerous as well. People can spike the heart rate, they can spike the fever, they can open themselves up to strokes. Um, a lot of nice things can happen there too. Also, organs get stressed out. Sometimes people have underlying medical conditions, they don't necessarily know about it. So if you are doing cocaine, you're doing ecstasy, if you have a liver problem, you're not metabolizing things properly, that can lead to complications. Or I'll stop it off you two story for a moment. I was young, I was 18, a kid who I dated did cocaine. They went to the beach and thought the backseat was far. And people drove around in the car for 40 minutes. They were just getting around. They were going to St. John's Hospital for a lot of way. He was DOA. He had a heart attack. There was an undetected heart murmur. And that was really a kid that could live. It's really, really unfortunate. Um, and I learned in this industry after doing this a little while and witnessing stories personally and professionally, I like to think about something called the YET concept. YET stands for you're eligible to. Very simple. YET, you're eligible to. Young people in particular think that they're invincible. That next bad thing is never going to happen to them. It's going to be something you read about in the paper. It's going to happen to somebody else. I'm too strong. I'm too smart. I got this. I know what I'm doing. Sometimes that's not true. We're all vulnerable, and we're all always eligible to serve. Um, last thing I'm not going to spend much time with is that sometimes people have underlying mental health conditions. Some of you might be aware about this. You may already be struggling with anxiety. You may be struggling with depression or something else even. Um, drugs and alcohol are really not the way for you to go. They may look like your friends, but at the end of the day, those things get aggravated with depression. They get aggravated with anxiety. People tend to think about alcohol and say, I want to drink. I forget about the problems. It makes me feel good. That's for a moment because you get this whole cascade of endorphins and feeling good. But the moment the alcohol really starts to kick in, you crash. And truth be told, how many steps you end up more depressed than when you first started to drink. But sometimes for some people, when they drink when they drug, something else happens in their brain, and the underlying mental health condition that could have been dormant becomes activated. Um, sometimes people end up with psychosis. That means you lose touch with reality. You're hearing things, you're seeing things. Um, it could be drug abuse, you can end up in the hospital. Most of the time, people recover from that. Sometimes people don't really recover too well. And it could be the start of some things that really bad for you. Um, so, something to think of. And again, if you're mixing drugs and they tend to have opposite effects, it's really, really difficult to keep track of what you're doing. And again, if you think about the adolescent brain, the developing brain, this just adds to your troubles already with what you like to call executive. It gets a little bit more dry. So I am advising and suggesting to you guys, whatever your plans might be, be safe. If it involves any of the mixing of the things you talked about, you might want to take an opportunity to reconsider some of that. Um, next thing I want to talk to you guys about is alcohol and blackouts. And most of the people think about blackouts, they think about somebody gets drunk and passes out and falls down. That's not really what a blackout is. That's passing out. You can have an alcohol blackout, and you can still be fully alert and fully conscious. The thing about it is you don't realize what's happening. You don't know what you're doing. Alcohol, particularly when you drink it, is very insidious in the way that it really kind of affects the brain. So Kevin lays it out on the left over there. The first thing that happens, people get drunk, they think it's funny, they stumble about. You know, maybe the coordination is off a little bit. Um, the decision making is not great. <coughs> Perhaps they say yes to things when they, they should have said no. 
Um, so let's get a regular question. That's just the beginning. When somebody's getting too stable and they're starting to black out, that's because the alcohol is kind of starting to black out, what's called the mid midrange. So people lose control of their emotions, um, they're not in the right mind, they do their wrong things they buy, they're saying things they don't need to say, they're doing things that have them out of pocket, they don't necessarily know what to do if they're not in that type of condition. So that can become a problem for folks as well. That's really the stage where people, wow, I did that last night, maybe I'm doing it, did I say that? How did I look up here? Who are these people? Where am I? All of that can really be associated with alcohol or blackout. But the third stage is really, really scary. That's when the brain really, the alcohol really affects the of the brain stem. And that basically is all your automatic functions that you don't think about too much. So your body temperature, your heart rate, your respiration. And when those things begin to slow down, you're setting yourself up for a very potentially fatal condition. All of you have heard about alcohol poisoning, right? This is how alcohol, alcohol poisoning works. The alcohol has now gotten to your brain cell and has now impacted all that functioning that you take for granted. So that's problematic. And you know, when you see somebody that's drinking a lot, if you're starting to black out, if you're starting to pass out, or they're dozing off, they're probably in trouble. And I'm going to tell you, coffee, or showers, walking people around may help if just for a little while. The thing about it is you have to actually get them to see your heart. Because they might be right for a bit, but if they continue on the left unattended, they might fall right back into the place that they were in. It's a type of injury or accident or even death that's preventable. Um, other things to speak to you about really quickly is overdose awareness. Anybody know anybody here that's overdose? I know people that's an hour Oh, yeah, yeah, not too many. I get you folks here too. That's not so cool. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Most overdoses of this, seven out of ten of them happen in the home. So I guess my question for you guys on your prom night or at any other point in time in your life moving you forward is if you want somebody who's just overdosing, would you know the signs of it? And would you know what to do? So, First and foremost, an opioid overdose happens when too much of the opioid gets into the receptors um, all at one time, and then those receptors stop, slow and stop the breathing. So in your brain, and your stomach, and the various parts of your body, you use something called an enemy receptor. And that's the receptor that responds to opioids, that's the receptor that responds to oxys, roxys, and when people get inundated, they get very, very high. So first, it's a good feeling, then it's a very drowsy and very, very sleepy feeling. So how do you know when somebody's in trouble? The first thing is that maybe that person's breathing has gotten a little slow. Maybe they're kind of dizzy and disoriented. Maybe you can't wake them up and you hear some kind of groaning or choking sound. That's a clue. Maybe you can have a look at their eyes. Most of the time when we think about people being high, we think that their pupils being very big. When somebody's in the midst of an opioid overdose, the opposite is true. The pupils are what we call thin. They're very, very small. So that's sometimes a clue. Um, if somebody's skin is clammy, cold to touch, if their lips are blue, their nails are blue, we have some idea that there's a problem. Um, I'll take you back for a moment to my friend that passed away from the cocaine. People were afraid to get him help. That's how he died. Very often with an opioid overdose, people are also afraid to get help. We need not be. The reason for that is that there's something called a good Samaritan law. So if somebody is drunk and you know they're going out like that, or they're high on prescription drugs, and you don't know why you need to an opioid, never be afraid to call 911. You're not going to get in trouble. You have to have an awful lot of narcotics on you. And really, truly, in this day and age, with all the awareness that we have, it's really just about saving lives. That's people, you know, caring about. Um, you know, it's all right. The underage drinkers just get help from the individual. Marijuana, they're really not interested. All right. So it's important. That's a real opportunity to respond. It's an opportunity to save a life. Um, you know, and I know it's hard sometimes. Oh wow, that's not cool. James may be mad at me. Stevie may be mad at me. 
They might, but I'd rather have the friend dramatically than have them be dead. So, you know, it's really something to take in. Um, there's also something called Narcot. I know you guys have to have some training with that. I don't have the opportunity to do that with you guys today, but if we have not on kids, if we still have them, it's probably also a good time to bring out to the top. Um, these are just some references and resources for people out in the land. Um, it's always helpful to this whole. This should be a beautiful beginning. It's spring. We're in a new season of life. Please, guys, girls, ladies, stay alive. Have a happy day. Stay calm. Thank you. My name is Debbie Brookhardy. I am a pediatric nurse practitioner at Cohen Children's Medical Center. I get to speak to the parents, not the children. So, I should say not the students, but when I say children, I'm sorry about that one. Mm -hmm. So, I know where are they leaving? How are we doing this with the students? So, we're going to split up. Students, we're actually going to put you in the cafeteria for the next round. So, the quicker and more. Quietly, you're able to go to the cafeteria. The sooner you will be able to sleep in. Parents, be set.